Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks especially to the basketball fans who are joining us tonight with the Warriors in game one of the series. Nice to see so many faces for this uh, sure to be great program. My name is Laura Tam. I'm Spur Sustainability and Resilience Director. Um, for people who may not be familiar with Spur, we are a member supported nonprofit organization. Our mission is to promote good planning and good government through research, education and advocacy. And we put ideas and action together to make a better city and region. Please raise your hand if you're a member. Oh, well, not too many. So just to explain a little bit about the benefits of membership, we are uh, members receive our wonderful magazine, The Urbanist, receive admission to events like this that we have almost every day. Well, this is a singular event, but we, we have lunchtime and evening programs almost every day in our offices in San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. Um, and there are also other special events that we encourage you to join us for as a member. Um, our next event coming up is next Wednesday, June 8th, the famous and funny post-election recap. For anybody who didn't know, which is impossible, almost impossible to think of in these days, uh, there is an election next Tuesday. You can vote now or later. Um, we encourage you to support Measure AA, which is on the ballot and is about restoring the Bay. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can ask me about it later. So today's forum, I'm delighted to introduce, or I will, they will be introduced, but I'm delighted to talk about this topic today, a renewable future. A couple of luminaries in the field are here with us. We will be talking, uh, they will be talking about their new book, Our Renewable Future. And after the program, you can purchase a signed copy um, outside at the desk. So that's a special benefit of being here tonight. So I'd also like to extend a special thank you to tonight's co-presenters, Island Press, and to, to introduce our, our speakers today, I'm going to turn it over to a share with the Post Carbon Institute. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to Spur for hosting this and to our friends at Island Press who are our partners in publishing this book, which is uh, actually out officially today at the first time. Um, so I'll keep these comments short as, uh, by way of introduction. Uh, since you all want to the rest of the Warriors game at the end. The renewable future, it's something that we feel, and I think a lot of people feel, is an urgent priority for society. Um, as news about climate change uh, and our, the effects of climate change uh, already unfolding become more and more urgent, uh, the call for the transition to a renewable future uh, becomes more strident, uh, more unified, uh, in our view, it's an inevitable transition. The real question is, how do we manage the transition? And what does the future look like? Now, there have been uh, some great uh, analysis. There's been some great analysis done. Uh, some plans have been uh, developed by, by different people. Some of you may have uh, heard of, of some of these. Uh, maybe the most commonly known is uh, from Mark Jacobson at Stanford and others at Greenpeace, Sierra Club, others have... Uh, put together plans to sort of lay out a blueprint for how we can transition to to renewable energy future. But a lot of those plans are really focused on on the supply question. And in our view, after reviewing those plans and, and looking at the conversation that was taking place, we felt like there was a real need and opportunity to think more deeply about how we use energy and what's entailed in this transition and what the future might actually look like. After all, we did build this modern world, the world outside the windows that we're looking at, or I am looking at right now, based upon the unique properties of fossil fuels. Uh, it wasn't the other way around. We didn't find an energy source that you know suited our suburban lifestyles or uh, our you know prodigious use of, of air conditioning and heat. Um, we, fe we found these tremendous sources of energy and we built the, the modern world around them. And uh, the properties of renewable energy are different. And so uh, the future may look different. And that's what our uh, two speakers tonight have been exploring together uh, throughout their, their careers, but particularly looking at the uh, development of this, this book is looking at uh, plans that have been developed and then also looking at some of the challenges, the low hanging fruit and the fruit that might be really hard for us to pick. Um, so they're going to share with us tonight uh, some of the results of their analysis. Obviously, you can't go into as much detail as, as they did in the book. I also just want to let folks know that 
We have the entire contents of the book available for free online at ourrenewablefuture.org. And there's some additional resources there that we weren't able to put into the book. So I'm going to introduce our two speakers at the same time right now and then turn it over to David. And afterwards, we'll do a Q&A session. So David Fugley has been a staff scientist at the Energy Analysis Program in Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory since 1995. He's a deputy group leader of the China Energy Group, which collaborates with China on end-use energy efficiency, government energy management programs, and energy policy research. Uh, he's been nearly 30 years now working and living in China in the energy sector. He's a fluent Mandarin speaker. He's not the only one. I guess we have at least one more here. And um, prior to joining the lab, he spent 12 years working as a consultant on downstream oil markets in the Asia-Pacific Asia region. He's also someone who's done a lot of analysis looking at biofuels, uh, particularly here in California. He's one of the smartest people I know uh, on energy issues across the board. He's the guy I turn to all the time when I hear something and I don't understand it. Um, and uh, joining him is Richard Heinberg. Richard is a senior fellow in residence at Post Carbon Institute. He's widely regarded as one of the world's foremost advocates for the shift away from our current reliance on fossil fuels. Our Renewable Future is his 13th book. Um, he's also authored scores of essays and articles uh, that have been published in Nature Journal, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, American Prospect, and a bunch of other places. Uh, over the last 10, 15 years, he's probably delivered over 500 lectures around the world, um, from you know uh, small presentations to peace activists to uh, presenting at the European Parliament. Uh, and he's been quoted and interviewed uh, countless times uh, in films and television and print and radio, including Reuters, the Associated Press, Time Magazine, NPR, and NBC. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David, and then Richard will come up after. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming out. I'm really gratified to see so many seats filled. Um, frankly, I didn't think it would be a basketball game. That would be the competition, of course, the clean energy ministerial. Um, like I should have said, I've, you know, I've been thinking about energy for 30, 35 years, so it's my favorite subject, and I hope it will be yours after I'm done with you tonight. Um, but I wanted to start with looking at what is the big picture? Where, where are we now? Well, you know, where is this renewable energy future going to come from? And this is called a Sankey diagram. You've probably seen them. It illustrates the flow of energy through a system, in this case, the United States. And over there on the far left is what we call our primary energy forms, the, 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 the coal, the crude oil, the natural gas, the other kinds of primary energy that we extract from the ground or produce, along with the solar and the nuclear and the uh, other uh, electricity forms. Um, as this stuff moves to the right, it enters a phase we call transformation. It's not really illustrated here except for electrical generation. But some of this energy we just can't use directly. I mean, we don't use crude oil. We use stuff we make from crude oil. So some of this energy has to be transformed into another form, like you know, coal or natural gas or, or is, in the United States at least, is the main transformation that provides the electric, uh, the electric power we use. And then the refining system provides, you know, gasoline, diesel loops, and everything else. But then we get over to the right, and this is, you know, how we use energy. This is the energy services that we demand. You know, we don't really demand gasoline. We demand mobility. We don't really demand natural gas. We demand comfort in our homes. We demand illumination. These are the services that energy provides to us. And there's two really salient points I want to leave on this part. And one is that all those gray bars, this area is, is energy that's lost. So already, uh, you know, you can see that in particular, the power generation sector, we lose most of the energy that goes into it. Uh, in the United States, our fleet's only about 33% efficient. It's even worse than China. Uh, and so, a lot of that energy is just lost as heat. We tolerate this, one, because we've always had a lot of fossil fuels, and two, because we really value electricity. But also here in the end use side, down to the lower right, you'll see transportation. You'll see a lot going in and very little coming out as the actual service of mobility. 
Most of it is mechanically lost because we rely upon internal combustion engines. Um, the second thing is, uh, following on what Asher said, most of the studies we're, we've looked at for renewable energy development has focused on the left side with questions such as how many how many PV panels and how many windmills and, and uh, how many you know hydro dams can we build to make the electricity that would feed the supply side. And we're coming at this from the complete opposite. We're looking at how do we use energy on a day-to-day -day basis? What services does it provide? And all, what kind of renewable alternatives are there? So if you look at final energy use, this is the energy we use every day, not that primary stuff over we get out of the ground, but this is what we use every day. Uh, and in the U.S., you can see, you know, noticeably there at the bottom is a big chunk of gasoline. We drive an awful lot. Um, and there's other forms. We also get mobility from diesel that moves our stuff around. We get our comfort from natural gas heating. We get, uh, uh, you know, we get our pavement from asphalt. We get, uh, uh, you know, our air travel from jet fuel and on and on and on. But then there's also this chunk of electricity. And of all of the energy we use every single day, only 21% of it is in the form of electricity. And of that electricity broken out to the right here, you can see that you know we've got huge chunks of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power, and this small sliver of solar, wind, and geothermal. So that's where we're starting. This smaller pie has to be completely decarbonized. And once we de decarbonize it, we still have 79% of the energy used in this country that's still carbon. So it's an enormous task ahead, and we have to understand what can we do, how can we do it, and, and uh, how fast can it happen. But the U.S. is not the largest energy consumer in the world by far. China is. Uh, so, you know, our challenge is magnified more with China. This is a look at China's final energy consumption, 40% larger than the U.S., and because it's mostly coal-based, it's uh, nearly twice as much in terms of CO2 emissions than the, than the United States. And still today, whereas in the United States, only 1.5% of our final energy use is in the form of coal, more than half of the final energy use in China, which is, is coal and coal derivatives, so coke, coke or gas, things like that, that come out of coal. So uh, the other half of their coal goes to generate their electricity. In China, electricity is only 19% of their final energy use, and it's 75% uh, coal. The, the largest hydro development in the world, which is that big slice of hydro pie, but again, like the United States, solar wind and geothermal, despite the fact that China is one of the leaders in solar and wind deployment, as I'm sure you've heard, this is where they're starting from. So the challenges are huge. Um, there's two ways that we consume energy. We consume energy directly. You go to a filling station and put some gas in your car. You turn on a switch and consume electricity. You turn up the heat and your natural gas starts combusting. Uh, but we also consume energy indirectly. And that, that indirect um, energy comes in the form of all the energy that's used that's used in that long production chain that provides you all the goods and services that you use every day. Um, it uh, you know includes oil, coal, gas, and so forth. And this embodied energy actually can be a very substantial part of uh, of a person or a thing's uh, in an energy footprint. And so beyond what we just use directly, which we hope we can you know uh, turn into a renewable form as soon as possible, we also have to think about that chain, that looking up the chain, as I call it, of what the embodied energy, how, how does it get embodied and what can we do about it? So most of the embodied energy that we consume every day is in the form of products that we make from the U.S. manufacturing sector. Well, not the U.S. manufacturing sector, but manufacturing sector. Uh, so here I've shown the U.S. and China in terms of their manufacturing energy use, which is, you know, if it's not the U.S., then most of the goods we do consume come from China. And again, you can see electricity is only a very small part of what's used in manufacturing. It's only 12 percent in the U.S. and 20 percent in China. And um, the rest is fossil fuels. So when we take that first step back of a, of a good that we're using and look at its manufactured um, origin, we have to think about, you know, is there a way to manufacture things also in a renewable way? 
uh, not just consume our, our energy directly in a renewable way. And the biggest, you know, to me, the biggest thing we have to consider is cement. I call it the foundation of modern civilization with full pun intended. Uh, you know, cement is ubiquitous. It is the structure and foundation of our entire built environment. But it's also a double whammy when it comes to, to emissions. Um, just the process of calcinating limestone to make clinker, to make cement, emits as much CO2 as comes out of the energy that's used to make the cement. So for every ton of cement we make, we get just about a ton of CO2 coming off of it. Um, and yet we don't use cement directly. We have to mix it with aggregate and sand and water to make concrete. And we make so much concrete in the world that every person in the world consumes on average about four tons of concrete every single year. And that concrete has to be, you have to have aggregate. So it needs to be mined and it's mined with diesel-based machines and it uh, has to be transported with, with diesel-based uh, uh, transport modes. Um, same with sand. And then, then it goes into production. So cement to me is, is uh, you know, it, provides a particular conundrum with regard to building a renewable future because right now there is no renewable way to do it. You can't use electricity to make cement at the moment. Um, and buildings embody a lot of these materials that come out of mining and manufacturing. Uh, you can see on the left is kind of the life cycle circle of a building. It, it includes the materials that are used in the building that those materials have to be transported with oil, of course, uh, and then there, it has to be constructed. Then we use the building. We operate the building. In the United States, operations still is the largest portion of the energy footprint of a building today. But then we have to maintain the building and then we have to decommission or deconstruct it. So the use phase, you know, is, is also of great importance. This is, after all, where people live and people work and people go to school are all in buildings. So as an example for uh, a, the single, uh, single family homes in the United States, on an average across all homes, this is the energy breakdown. And you can see that even in homes, only 43% of the energy we use in homes is in the form of electricity and natural gas, propane and fuel oil pretty much rounded out. For some uses, for example, like refrigeration or air conditioning, that's already all fully electric based. So whether those electrons come from a PV panel or whether they come from a coal power plant, they're indifferent. Uh, of more concern are things such as uh, water heating, uh, and space heating, which still are predominantly non-electric in the U.S. Um, and all of these would have to find a renewable alternative or convert to electricity in some form or another, which, which raises another point that you don't normally see in these other studies about what it's going to cost to create a renewable future is that, uh, you know, the developer of this wind power plant is not going to buy you an electric water heater. Uh, there's going to be an enormous expense on the end user to replace all of that equipment that is not suitable uh, under a different energy regime. Uh, clothing is a great example of a long supply chain leading to a rather irrational buildup of, of uh, embodied energy within a very common product. That's Levi's own graphic of what how their jeans are made. And a single pair of jeans sold down the street here will have traveled from four to five different countries before it actually ends up in the store here with uh, you know, the fiber being produced in Texas and the, and the fabric being produced in Mexico. And then it's sent to the Dominican Republic for one thing, and then it's trucked over to Haiti for another, and then back to the Dominican Republic and back to the US and then trucked around the US until it's finally sold. All of that energy that's embodied in that, linked by these transport links all powered with oil, total about 111 kilowatt hours equivalent. Nonetheless, most, a little more than half of that energy is what we call, you know, the use of the genes. You wash them, you dry them, you wash them again, you dry them again. And that's, that's about half of the energy footprint of the gene. But added all together, you're talking about six tons of CO2 from buying one pair of genes. So I think if everybody in this city who bought genes went out and planted six trees to compensate for their emissions, 
deficit, this would be the most wooded city in, 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 in the world. Um, the food system displays a lot of the same irrationalities. Um, to me, the U.S. industrial agricultural system is a manifest failure in terms of sustainability. Um, yes, it produces a lot of calories and it feeds a lot of people, but the fact that it consumes 15%, this entire system consumes 15% of all the energy in the country, yet delivers in terms of food energy about 1% of the total energy we consume uh, is just irrational and certainly unsustainable. In the U.S. today, we consume 12 calories just to deliver one calorie to your plate. And you can contrast this to the last, let's say, advanced societies there were prior to the Industrial Revolution. And these were, for example, Europe and China, where on average it was 0.85 to 0.9 inputs to one output. It actually, food was not an energy sink, it was an energy source, which is the way it ought to be. And just that little bit of, of surplus, that 15 to 10% uh, surplus, was enough to support the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and, you know, artists and writers and kings and, and, and armies who did not grow their own food. Uh, today, we've just completely lost uh, uh, the ability to understand that. Now, you know, a lot of this, you know, high embodied energy in food comes from this kind of supply chain. We're starting, you know, up with agriculture in the far left and every one of those links, the red lines that represents oil use. Uh, you know, many people say that modern U.S. agriculture is really a way of turning petroleum into food. And it's it's uh, pretty much demonstrated here. We also use a lot of natural gas as well uh, to make our food and then more petroleum to make the pesticides and on and on and on. A number of years ago, and there's one person here who probably remembers it from SFA Oil. We, our SFA Oil group went down to the, um, uh, what's it called, the Wholesale Food uh, District in South San Francisco to talk to the folks who wholesale the food to, <clears throat> to all the retailers around here. And there was a guy there who was, who had worked there since the 60s. He was like the grand old man of, of the place. And it was very interesting hearing him talk about what San Francisco's food um, you know, system looked like back then. And it was one, much, much shorter. Um, the food shed at that point was the Central Valley to Southern California to Northern Mexico. Uh, and also it was highly seasonal. He said, you know, you would get sweet corn for three or four weeks a year and that was it. Sweet corn doesn't store. Um, so when it was available, you had it, and when it wasn't, you didn't. Uh, and we contrast that till today, after 30, 40 years of this, uh, what's called the, you know, this uh, cold chain, where this uninterrupted cold chain of bringing food from New Zealand to a store here, never leaving a refrigerated area. 5% of the containers in the world are refrigerated just to move food around. Um, you know, it leads you to ask, you know, is, is this kind of, is this sustainable in a renewable energy system? You know, it would suggest perhaps that we, you know, in looking at this chain, that perhaps some of those chain links should not be there. The chain should be shorter. Um, it's certainly going to be easier to shorten the chain than to decarbonize it in the, in the shape that this, this chain is now. Um, Transportation. Uh, everyone has experience here. Uh, what uh, I'd like to point out is that, it, you know, in operating a car, it's not just either the electricity you put in or the gasoline that you put in. Uh, if you look at this embodied energy, the energy footprint of a car, you also have to consider the fact that the car would not be driving if there weren't this infrastructure for it. So for every road out there, every highway, even though there's hundreds of thousands of cars that use that same highway mile still, um, the energy expenditure to make that infrastructure is so huge that 2% of the uh, uh, 
energy footprint of a car is just from the infrastructure it drives on. There's an additional uh, uh, portion that's uh, because of the fuel. You actually have to make the fuel to put in the car, which also uh, consumes energy. And then finally, the manufacturing of, of cars uh, is, you know, as you see here, it's only 27% electricity. So if you look at that chain, we have to think, is there a way this chain can be uh, converted to a renewable energy use, or does something about this chain have to change? A number of years ago, I was very dissatisfied with uh, the kind of the traditional economic and energy analysis view of the world, which is everything is divided into industry and transport and commercial buildings and residential buildings and agriculture and construction. And they all seem to exist because they exist. But, you know, it, 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 you know I, but to me, they only existed because of us. Uh, none of those things exist unless we needed a place to live, clothes to, you know, food to eat, uh, places to go, a desire to move, a desire to consume. All of this stuff exists for us. So I created a model that turned the analysis of the impact of having people in cities kind of on its head and said all of us are responsible for the energy, embodied energy that we're collectively responsible for having created this physical world around us. And I chose an example, the city of Suzhou in China. It's a very nice city, about 7 million people, very pretty, historical, uh, to the west of Shanghai, and um, applied this analysis here. And what I found was that for the entire city of 7 million people, only a third of the energy footprint was from this, you know, everyday use of energy, the operational energy to run the transport, to light the buildings, uh, to heat the homes and, and to cook the food. And 68% of it was embodied. It was the energy that was embodied in the infrastructure, the roads, the sidewalks, the light poles, everything else that was there, the buildings, the residential buildings they lived in, the commercial buildings where they worked in, had meetings, went to school, got sick in, uh, and, and so forth and so on, along with the embodied energy of the vehicles that moved them around, be it a bus, I mean, Suzhou actually is like capital of e-bikes in China. So I included e-bikes in there. But the majority even here, 61%, was the residential living consumption. That's the, uh, and I further broke that out. And in China, fully 53% of the energy footprint of a resident is, um, is the food. And 30% is clothing and the rest is it. Now, this may look large, but remember, Chinese don't have as much disposable income as we do. And they, on average, still spend 30 to 40% of their income on food as opposed to 10 to 12% here. Um, so, uh, you know, it really makes you uh, think that, you know, when we consider the idea that we need to move to a renewable energy system, that entire supply chain of everything that we consume daily we have to keep that in the mind. We have to look up the chain. Um, you know, I don't have a similar analysis for the U.S., but, you know, just from an expenditure point of view, you can see the same thing here. For, for an average American household, or what the Bureau of Labor Statistics calls a consumer unit, um, you know, energy is just 9% of what we spend our money on. I mean, that's, that's nothing. This is your electricity bill, your gas bill, your gasoline Everything that you spend is only 9% of your budget. Everything else is stuff that you buy that mobilizes an energy consumption happening somewhere else and gets embodied into those goods. You saw it with jeans. You saw it with your food. Uh, so it's your expenditures that have the most impact upon um, uh, our energy footprint. And, and I particularly like what Jeffrey West said. He was a guy who who developed the metabolic power law with regards to animals and found that it also applied to cities. Uh, and that was his statement. You know, our, our consumption fully outweighs any benefit that we're getting from doing things such as public transit. So all of this is happening in a fossil fuel world. Um, and so we have to look at what incentives are there to move away from this fossil fuel world. And so I'm showing here, and this is specifically San Francisco, uh, January to May this year, 
the relative prices of electricity versus uh, gasoline, diesel, propane, and so forth. And you can see electricity has this premium way above everything else. And there's a reason for that. It's, you know, it's not just the cost of generation. I mean, the cost of generation, I mean, PV and wind can be cheaper than coal in some places now. But, uh, you know, generation is only about a third to one half of what we actually pay for electricity. Um, but it has this premium because electricity can simply just do more stuff for us. It has what's called high exergy. It's almost 100%. And so it's always going to, to attract that kind of premium. Um, and so when we think about how can we move away from fossil fuels to a renewable source such as electricity, we have a disincentive here. We have a disincentive to move away from it because of this relative pricing that has to be addressed through policy, um, you know, preferably through something like a carbon tax or, or, or something else that would, would uh, reduce that change. Electrification is quite feasible already where your electric alternative is much more efficient than your non-electric alternative. And so a good example, for example, is using a motor and seven engine. An EV filling up on six cent per megajoule electricity still operates more cheaply than an engine, an internal combustion engine, filling up on um, two cent uh, per megajoule gasoline because motors are that much more efficient than uh, engines. And the same with heat pumps um, versus furnaces. If, uh, you know, natural gas is one cent a megajoule now in San Francisco. Um, but a heat pump can have a COP of three. That means it can, it can move three times more heat into your area than the energy used to do it. So that diminishes that, that difference in price between these things. But if you're just using electricity to substitute for something that's just done by heat, it's a very inferior use of the good. So just to sum all this up, this transition is inevitable, it's necessary, and it's certainly in progress. Um, and as I mentioned, most of the studies you see are looking at how do we change our supply. We really need to think about how we use energy, and what can we do to develop substitutes for that entirely complex supply chain, uh, supply chain and these production processes that bring us all, all the goods and services that we use every day. And there's a lot of work. I mean, I don't think any of us uh, deny that just to decarbonize the electricity that we use already, much less move on and then decarbonize the entire system. But the first thing, and always the cheapest, is to do things more efficiently and just don't consume energy at all uh, through reducing consumption and avoiding that use of energy in the first place. And here I'll turn it over to Richard. Thank you, David. You can imagine uh, listening to the last uh, uh, half hour, why it was such a, uh, a pleasure for me working with David over the last year and why I learned so much in the process. Um, I'm going to say a, 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 just a few sort of summary things to, to uh, close out the time. Um, first is that there, there is good news. I mean, it's not just all hard hard stuff with the energy transition to renewables. Uh, th there is very substantial good news, uh, part of which is the fact that solar and wind and hydro and geothermal produce electricity directly. So there are no conversion losses. Uh, so there's a lot of wasted energy uh, that uh, a lot of energy currently wasted in those conversion processes that we just won't need to use. Uh, another advantage is that uh, renewable energy sources generally are getting cheaper all the time as we develop the technology. Solar panels, wind turbines, it's all about technology, whereas fossil fuels 
uh, we're talking about resources, uh, non-renewable resources extracted from the earth. So we extract them using the low-hanging fruit principle. And as we extract them over time, we're having to extract lower and lower quality resources. So on one hand, solar wind getting cheaper. On the other hand, fossil fuels getting more costly to extract all the time. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, as, as you've already heard, this is not going to be a simple matter of unplugging the coal power plant, plugging in the solar panel, and then continuing to use energy the way we've been accustomed to using it. Um, I said I'd give you a summary, and uh, I'm going to talk about three, three levels of difficulty in the energy transition. This is, this is a way of summarizing what, what we learned over the last year. Um, and I say levels rather than, than stages, because stages would imply a sequence. First we do this, then we do that. And we're, all going, to, we're going to have to do all of these things more or less simultaneously, but some things are definitely going to be easier than others. In the, in the easy stuff category would be phasing out coal. Clearly, most of the coal used in this country is in electricity generation, and we have alternatives. So one of the first things we could do is simply retire coal as an energy source in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> heat pumps, as, as David has mentioned, heat pumps are very efficient, and in, in many parts of this country, indoor heat is a big deal, not so much in California, but in the Northeast, in the Northern Midwest, people spend a lot of money on heat during, during the winter. They generally have poorly insulated houses, and they don't feel as though they have much of a, a, uh, an alternative. Uh, uh, ground source and especially air source heat pumps are a good alternative and they're much more widely available today than they were even just a few years ago. We do have electric cars now. They are becoming more uh, widely available. There are more models on the market every passing year. But an easier, more, uh, more cost-effective direct solution is just getting people out walking and bicycling more, making it safer and easier and uh, uh, cheaper for people to, to do that. Uh, then there are things that we can electrify that we may not even think about right away, like cooking. Um, and again, this is an expense that probably will fall mostly on, on homeowners, not on utility companies. But nevertheless, it's, it's part of the renewable energy transition. Uh, and then our food choices, localizing our food, uh, choosing food that has minimal fossil fuel inputs, going to farmers markets, reducing processing and packaging and so on. All of those things we can basically do right now. Harder stuff, well, of course, we need to build more solar panels and wind, tur wind turbines. But when solar and wind begin to make up a really large proportion of our overall electricity, then we start having to deal with the fact that these are intermittent energy sources. Sun doesn't always shine, wind doesn't always blow. So once we get past 60 to 80 percent of our electricity coming from intermittent sources like solar and wind, we will start having to uh, deal with the need for energy storage. Batteries are getting cheaper, but inevitably uh, batteries are going to be an expensive way to store uh, electricity, to store energy. Pumping water uphill, uh, pumping air into underground caverns. There are various other ways of storing energy, but we're going to have to explore uh, all of those. Uh, there are other ways of buffering that intermittency. We can uh, we can build redundant generation capacity, or we can change how and when we use electricity, demand adaptation, and, and that's going to be the cheapest and fastest. Um, <clears throat> building a lot of electric cars is uh, what people immediately think of when they think of transportation. 
But it's not going to be the best long run solution because cars represent so much embodied energy. They're an inherently inefficient form of transportation. So more public transportation will be important. But, you know, we, when we think of transportation, we mostly think about transporting people. But in fact, the vast majority of the tonnage that we transport is not tons of people, but tons of stuff. And a lot of that gets transported by ship. So what do we do about that? Well, we can make ships more efficient with kite sails, maybe making them 60% more efficient. But even in that case, they'll still be using some oil. Uh, we can make our buildings far more energy efficient if we design them that way. In Ger Germany, of course, they have the passive house movement where they've constructed 25,000 structures that use maybe a, a tenth of the energy of a similar sized building, um, conventional building. Here in the US, we've built only a handful of, of passive house structures. It really takes changing the, the building codes in communities around the country uh, so that those, those more stringent uh, building standards are, are adopted and we could reduce the amount of energy used in buildings for especially for heating, air conditioning, but also lighting quite dramatically. We know how to do it. In fact, the, the, the principles on which the passive house movement has been built in Germany were pioneered here in the U.S. back in the 1970s during the, uh, the energy crises of the 1970s, but they were applied in Germany, so we need to bring them back home. Then we get to the, the really hard stuff, and David talked about some of these things. Uh, making really big buildings typically involves a lot of concrete and steel. And concrete and steel are going to be very difficult to make with, uh, with renewable energy. Not impossible. We identified potential ways of producing the high heat for, for making uh, cement. It could conceivably do be done in solar kilns or in kilns fired by uh, maybe a liquid fuel produced, uh, a methanol or something like that produced. Uh, using renewable electricity, but there are no demonstration projects currently running that we have identified, and there's no way to tell how much more expensive these processes would be. So realistically, we need to think about a renewable future in which we just use a lot less concrete and steel, more local natural materials, recycled materials, building more to a human scale, and probably enclosing a lot less space per capita. You know, the average size American home has grown from 1,000 square feet to 2,400 square feet in the last 50 years. Maybe that trend will be reversed over the next 50 years. As David mentioned, uh, some of our Energy in manufacturing is also already in the form of electricity, running assembly lines, and so on. But mining energy is almost all from uh, diesel and other fossil fuels. So we really have to look at the supply chains, uh, and particularly where those supply chains use fossil fuels as feedstocks. Think of all the plastics and other petrochemicals that we surround ourselves with, the computer that's sitting here in front of me, the paint on these walls, the uh, uh, carpets, uh, drapes, on and on. You know, we're surrounded by fossil fuels that are uh, uh, used in the manufacturing of products. So manufacturing as a whole is going to have to uh, shift probably to a smaller scale using uh, more labor, recycled natural materials. We have to start thinking about reusing and repairing rather than a consumer consumerist economy where we prioritize uh, uh, throwing things away and replacing them as quickly as possible so as to make more jobs. We have to imagine an economy that's, that's a conserver economy where we're actually reusing uh, and repairing consumer goods as much and as long as possible. Uh, think about uh, cell phones, for example, smartphones. Uh, right now, we 
toss them away after 18 months and, and, uh, and buy the, the latest model. What if you got one when you turned 18 and uh, for the rest of your life, it got remanufactured, parts replaced uh, and recycled and repaired and so on. That's more like what nature can actually uh, provide us with on a sustainable basis. We weren't able to come up with any really good prospects for the aviation industry. Theoretically, there are substitutes for uh, kerosene jet fuel. We could use sophisticated biofuels. We could use cryogenic hydrogen. But the, the transition from our current aviation industry to those substitutes is very difficult to imagine. The much higher costs that would inevitably be involved with those alternative fuels uh, would almost certainly shrink the industry. We have to think in terms of shifting our transportation, not only of people, but also of stuff, toward the most efficient transport uh, modes. Finally, we were able to identify a, a real opportunity in agriculture to uh, actually take carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it in soils by transforming our agricultural system. It's not only a matter of reducing the amount of, of oil and other fossil fuels we use in growing food, transporting food, uh, and so on. If we were to adopt a more localized form of agriculture that was also more ecologically based, where we were uh, producing more topsoil rather than eroding it, we could capture and sequester very significant amounts of carbon back into the soil where much of it formerly was. So again, summarizing, we, we see a future in which we use energy very differently and in which we almost certainly will use a lot less energy. We didn't try to come up with a specific figure of how much energy the U.S. or the world will use in the year 2050. But we conclude that it, that it will certainly be very significantly less than demand estimates produced by the International Energy Agency and other official agencies based on simply extending out recent uh, trends of energy demand growth. One way we know that demand ultimately will, will uh, contract is just from the, the ecological footprint analysis that's undertaken by the, the Global Footprint Network. They've shown that um, if all of the uh, productive capacity of the economy had to be uh, done in a way that was actually sustainable, it would take us one and a half Earth's worth of uh, land surface area currently uh, on a global basis and four Earths if we imagined everyone on Earth living at a, a US standard of living. So asking whether renewable energy can enable us to continue living the way we are and consuming as much energy as we currently do is basically asking whether renewable energy can enable us to continue living unsustainably. Well, maybe it could theoretically for a time, but why even try? We should aim for a sustainable level of consumption, which is, at least in the U.S., uh, we can see about 25% or less of what we're already consuming. So if we, if we were to aim for that level of energy consumption, it would be far easier to engineer an energy system in which we would need far less storage, in which we would need far fewer solar panels, wind turbines, and uh, all the rest. So our energy future we see as one that is less total energy. The energy will be less controllable. So we will use energy when it's available and where it's available to a much greater degree than just expecting it to be at our fingertips anytime.
It will probably be a future of less mobility because transportation is going to be one of the harder uh, uh, substitutions to solve, and it will be therefore also be more localized. It's not going to be a plug and play situation, but more of a civilization reboot. We also have to think of energy equity. It's possible to imagine a renewable future in which only the communities, the households, and the countries that can afford enormous amounts of solar panels and wind turbines end up having a renewable energy future or any f energy future at all. If we're going to uh, prevent that kind of energy inequity from occurring, we have to begin addressing it now, uh, both internationally and, uh, and within uh, uh, nations and cities. I've already mentioned some of these, these opportunities and the costs will be adapt adaptation to a different kind of economy. But the longer we wait for the renewable energy transition, the more difficult it gets. Right now, we still have access to cheap, abundant energy from fossil fuels that we will need in order to fund the transition. We need energy to build solar panels and wind turbines and uh, uh, public transportation and all of the rest. So we should be devoting what energy we have now to the, the transition rather than simply continuing to use it for trips to Disneyland, etc. cetera. This is, this is serious business. If we don't get the energy transition right, we may not survive the 21st century with society in any kind of recognizable form. It's an enormous challenge, but challenges are inherently exciting. And if we look on it as an exciting and invigorating challenge, we have lots of creative opportunities on our hands. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, let's open it to questions. We're going to repeat your questions, so. Uh, so you're focusing in your book mostly on the news today. Um, could you address the military more? What can be done there? Shut them down. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, the question here is what do we do about the military? And, uh, that that's more of a political issue rather than a technical issue. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, the military is far ahead of the rest of our government and society in thinking about both the dangers of climate change and the challenges of peak oil and and a resource depletion and overpopulation and water shortages and things like that, because to them it becomes a threat. Um, and so it becomes a, a, a choice. You know, we, we seem to be faced uh, with kind of a future of endless war with the way that our thinking is going now. Uh, I mean, the military can procure the energy it needs to do what it needs. But, you know, military intervention and, um, uh, you, you know, uh, this constant uh, military engagement is kind of a sign of a failing society. And so to the extent that as a society we can rein in the military, that certainly would uh, release resources that could be used much better elsewhere. Yes, Richard, in one of your essays, uh, you talk about the positive effects of localization in terms of community values and less uh, uh, alienation perhaps of uh, more cooperative kinds of engagements which are a very positive and welcome uh, interpretation for forecast. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah the question is about the uh the, the opportunity afforded by, by localization. Uh yeah um in within 
the, the food system, the U.S. Department of Agriculture recognizes local food as, as the most significant trend in the U.S. food system currently. People like engaging with their neighbors. They like uh, knowing where their stuff is made. They like being able to buy things with a clear conscience and not worry that, you know, the, the thing they just purchased involved slave labor on the other side of the planet. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, multiplier, e economic multipliers from uh, keeping, keeping money within a local community, whether through banking and investment or, or manufacturing. Um, localization is more, as we explained, is more or less inevitable anyway because of uh, the nature of our energy future. If we can get out ahead of that trend, uh, I think that there will be uh, a lot of benefits. And in, in, in a way, I think the current election is a kind of referendum on globalization, at least in part, because we have uh, uh, two candidates, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who have um, made their appeal to uh, working class Americans, who many of whom have lost their jobs due to globalization and who, and who feel that the country's just going in the wrong direction. So um, regardless of, of one's political affiliation, I think it's, it's, it's clear that there's, uh, there's, there's a constituency for, for a trend back toward, toward local economies. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Tafka. I, I actually, uh, I'll just give a little context of uh, my question before I get to my question. I grew up on a, um, a large 2,000 acre organic dairy farm in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have some perspective on the question or the comment I'm about to make, which is I, I feel like the, we, first of all, I appreciate very much the comments that you've been making, fascinating uh, presentation. So uh, I feel like the comment about the uh, kind of talking about the time period when we were consuming uh, less beer, you know, and getting uh, was it 0.75 inputs to 1.25 outputs or something like that. It's really not, a, it's not really a helpful comparison. The, the standard living for most of the people at that time was, was really a physical low and standard of their lifespan, low of this model of disease. And most people were poor and supported their, you know, fewer work awards. So really, I don't think it's a particularly good example to, to draw the contrast to. It's not so, super helpful as a comment, but you can respond to it. Um, relative to Richard's presentation, um, you know, my my sense is that in, in a way that um, I appreciate the perspective, but I feel like it, this is actually vote a little bit. And the the reason why is that you know why come at it from the point of view of consumption is bad, and therefore we need to you know we need to all fight to work, you know, move people to Central Valley in California. Um, why not come from a, a different perspective, which is like, okay, we need to do some some consumption. Let's step down. Here are the steps. Okay, and here's what supports each step. I think the, the I mean, I appreciate the message, but the message I think needs to be supported more practically, more pragmatically. Um, we don't transform from a society that's consuming, you know, the way it is right now, and just automatically transform magically. It has to happen through pragmatic steps. And let's understand what those steps are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he made a comment about my reference to the pre-industrial revolution food system being an energy source rather than an energy sink. And that, that actually was my point, that a food system can be a source rather than a sink. Um, but at the same time, even today, I mean, there are billions of people whose standard of living is not much better than a European peasant in 1700. Uh, what this infusion, this huge infusion of fossil fuels has done to our, our, our food system is allow us to, uh, some of us, to eat quite grandly, eat things that even the king of England at that time would have never considered, uh, and certainly to consume much more than we need to consume. Um, but I, I, I take your point. It's it's it, it, it's not a one to one comparison. It was a feudal, rough society. But the point is, we cannot sustain. I mean, the 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 we cannot sustain a food system that takes twelve units of input to produce one unit of output and consume fifteen percent of all the energy in the nation. Uh, and the definition of sustainable means at some point it's going to stop. 
So again, it's something like um, actually your following point, which is what do we do about it, uh, and how do we get there? Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, it's it's a it's a fair point. Uh, we um, in in an hour's presentation, uh, or or in a uh, a short book, you know, can can suggest the general direction of trends. Um, currently and, and where we need to go, but the how we implement each of those phases, that's that's going to be the work of, of the next couple of generations. And, and uh, we, we, we suggest a few pathways in the book, but there's far more to be discovered along the way. You want to? Hey. Uh, my interest is political power. Something you're concerned about the crisis and the fairness of corruption, the outlooks of corruption, and what you suggest we do. <laughs> the crisis of imperialist overproduction. <clears throat> We've been through this before. Um, we went through this in the 1920s, and it ended up collapsing the nation um, and the world, pretty much, at that point. And frankly, in my point of view, we're facing the same thing. Um, and it's not just because there's so much surplus capacity in the world, and, and we just have to find new markets. I mean, China's facing it for sure. All of a sudden, they fell from 12% growth to 6% growth, and then all of a sudden, they have hundreds of millions of tons of steel production capacity that's not needed. But there's people who work there, and there's people whose livelihoods rely on that. And so the Chinese are doing the same thing we're doing. We're pouring in money after money and, and creating more and more debt to support a system that does overproduce, and is built upon unlimited exponential growth of consumption uh, that simply at some point, again, is unsustainable and is going to collapse. But from a political economy point of view, I don't know how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and what's going to spark it to happen. I would suggest after this um, meeting, if you have time, to speak with the man behind you, Nate, who could... Um, I, I think say some really enlightening things about that for you. <laughs> yeah, Nate. Nate has a question. Yeah. Um, probably switching gears. So the issue of you know you build solar panels and wind turbines in the last twenty or thirty years, and then you have to build them again, and then last and then replace them again. So they're really not renewables, right? They're re repeatables. And that brings up the question of nuclear, which in theory lasts a lot longer, although it still needs concrete and things like that. So I heard today that China is, is developing nine different new prototypes of nuclear that the U.S. and Europe aren't even researching. And I don't know the veracity of that. But maybe you can speak to how nuclear fits in the scheme of this at all. Yeah, that's definitely a question for David. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Uh, so the question is about how nuclear fits into all this. Uh, we really don't spend time on nuclear in the book simply because up front we frankly define it as a non-renewable resource. Um, uh, uranium is not renewable and uh, it, it, the current trends of demand just from China is going to make them 90% import dependent just by 2020. I mean, it's... it's um, so I, I, don't, I, I don't think from that point of view, uh, you, you know, nuclear has a huge future uh in a fully re uh, renewable world but i take your point it is a fossil fuel free uh once it's operating it's fossil fuel free not the enormous amounts of steel and concrete to go into it um and china has been putting a lot of effort into this they want to you know they've looked at thorium they've looked at all kinds of alternatives but they've been doing that since 1985 and even these prototypes that they were developing in 1985, the pebble beds, they still haven't gotten those uh, fully commercialized. So, you know, after 30 years, it, it's yet another one of those things where I put it into interesting art indeed that the Chinese are doing, but I wouldn't hold my breath for it to appear. 
but the, the, the Chinese are on the drawing boards, or, or officially they have plans for an enormous build-out of oh, yes. nuclear power. Do you think that they're going to accomplish that? Well, they have the license to GE's, um, what is it, the 1000 uh, plan, and they're going to start replicating it. And, yeah, they're going to, they're right now at 26 gigawatts, and they'll easily be about 50-some gigawatts by... Uh, 2020, but beyond that, I think it's questionable because now they're starting saying, okay, we're going to take it inland. I mean, China has 1.4 billion people. I mean, there's not much area inland where you can put a nuclear power plant safely. Um, but their long term, their own internal planning in their, for example, in, in the modeling they did for their Paris commitment at the Paris conference of their INDC was for 250 to 300 gigawatts of nuclear power by 2050. And the U.S. has 100. So this would, but I don't think that's going to happen. I truly don't. But the near term, I think, is pretty much cast. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have a short uh, word of food question that came up. Uh, back when I was a young man, I stumbled upon uh, a possible solution. Have you ever read, read the book Silent Green? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and it's even a better solution today, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, the more I've read about peak energy, the more I'm concerned about peak blame. Because you will see as the fracking goes down, as you all have done tremendous work on that, I'm concerned that rather than recognizing we live on a finite planet that's not getting any bigger, there's going to be blame and be blame with the environmentalists who must drill, blame of Exxon, not the don't like Exxon, blame of this, blame of that, rather than recognizing we all live in spatial earth together. And I think the understanding of the finite planet gets in the way of any sort of even the simple fixes yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we tried not to make our book a political statement to, uh, to promote this uh, uh, to try to massage the numbers to support a particular view about energy or the renewable future uh, we're just interested in as accurate a picture as we can of what renewable energy can do, what what the constraints are, what what the what the opportunities are, and um, the reality is we live in a very political world, and and when things don't go the way people want, then they then folks do get angry and and start casting blame around rather than looking at themselves and their own consumption patterns. We're, we're hopeful that at least some of humanity is, is rational and will <laughs> we'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, accept the, you know, just the, the, the simple facts that we're, we're presented with. Uh, we, we live on a finite planet with finite stores of fossil fuels, with uh, limited prospects for development of, of alternative energy resources. If we cooperate to develop those energy resources, we can have a very acceptable future. If we fight over what's left, it's going to be um, very ugly. I think it's more about psychology than politics. Yeah. And politics is long gone. And I think you have to look more at the psychology and get personal solutions rather than going for this guy or that guy. Okay, there's this John. Good evening, I'm John Berger. I was interested, uh, first of all, I, I really appreciate the interest in the fact that there's presentations. And I was off to hear a little bit more if you would about how we can deal with so-called recalcitrant modes that we refer to, for example, aviation or large ships or heavy trucks that we use in mining. And to some extent, we have to electrify those uses, not airplanes, but at this point, on the television channels. So we might demonstrate your models with the subject of cells on the movies. And you can also electrify the field 
motives. But clearly, there's going to be a long term need for liquid fuels. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the constraints that exist in providing sufficient biofuels of various kinds to meet those three thousand. Uh, so the question is about uh, how do we how do we meet the need a continuing need for liquid fuels for certain kinds of applications, particularly trucks and um, uh, ships and airplanes. I agree with you. Right now, there's there's n no way to create a 737 substitute running on you know renewable fuels unless it's run on something like an algae-derived diesel or something like that. The problem is anything that's bio-based, we've already gotten a taste of what trying to go bio-based means. Uh, going bio-based, uh, we had uh, this period of enthusiasm for biofuels starting around 2005 with the Energy Policy Act of 2005 uh, that mandated that by 2015 we were going to have hundreds of millions of gallons of cellulosic ethanol that's going to be fueling our vehicles. None of that happened. Um, we also launched uh, and created the policy instruments to allow the diversion of huge amounts of land, soil, water, fertilizer, uh, to produce corn to make uh, corn-based ethanol, in which in the end the, it produces only slightly more energy than all the fossil fuels that are put in to make it. Um, with things like al algae fuels, algae grows in water. Water weighs one ton per cubic meter. Moving around water is enormously uh, en energy intensive. And so trying to produce anything at scale by having to move a bunch of liquid around is going to be, uh, it, it may not be energy positive in the end. Um, we're also going to come up against a conflict with even, you know, the outlook beyond Paris. I mean, the Paris Agreement said, it, everyone knows the Paris Agreement is insufficient. And a lot more has to be done beyond what's been agreed upon at Paris. But the 2.5, you know, scenario out to the future, we kicked the can down the road by saying that after 2050, we're going to have to grow enough biomass equal to uh, using a quarter of the world's arable land today to burn in um, carbon capture and sequestration plants to be able to pull that carbon out of the atmosphere. It's delusional. So the problem ultimately with all bio energy is the fact that we have seven point so many billion people on the earth, so much arable land, water, uh, and it's not a an efficient way to get a fuel out of it, and we can't do it in a renewable way. I mean, biofuels today, the only way we can do it is to use a lot of fossil fuels to, to run the process, because all the processes require heat. So I, I don't, I, there's nothing in my mind that's a drop in. Uh, for these other kinds of uses. The problem with saying they can be electrified, yes, they can be electrified, but there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of mining machines out there that all would have to be replaced. And where's the prototype? Who's building them? Do they have safety inspections? You know, all, all this kind of stuff. So uh, I'm, uh, I think the best way to look at it is let's just do less of it. You know, already, we move more overburden in mining than is carried in all the rivers of the world. I mean, that's an enormous impact. That's why we're in the Anthropocene instead of the Holocene. Um, so I think if we just do less is a better solution. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. Thank you to our speakers, and thank you to Island Press.